Hello and welcome to another Aegis Accounting podcast. Uh, this week I've got a stack of papers in my hand and a coffee in the other because the budget has landed. We'll be going through this. We'll also be going through uh, some general tips around remote working, which might be happening with COVID-19 all over the place for you. So it might be something you benefit from and some specific tips on uh, delegating tasks um, and using the right kinds of tools if you're going to be doing remote working as well. Hopefully that's quite timely advice, so there should be something uh, useful uh, for you to make use of this week. Right, let's get into it. So it's the budget for 2020-2021. That is what has uh, landed uh, on well, a couple of days ago now. And uh, yeah, it's uh, that's why I have a stack of papers in my hand if you're watching the video um, or hearing the rustling on the uh, audio podcast uh, because there's a couple of things worth going through and I want to make sure I get them right. So big swig, big swig even, big swig of coffee and here goes. Now, we've had some of the details of the budget come out uh, beforehand because that's what happens. Uh, but some things have only ha been made clear during the speech itself. So I'm referring to bits of paper to make sure I don't get any of these big things wrong. But of course, there should be more detail about all of them coming out over the future days and weeks. So, you know, stay tuned to your favourite source of news for that, or we'll see what we can talk about in the coming weeks. But um, things that have been heard, a lot to do with coronavirus and uh, COVID-19 um, and specific measures to support with that. Uh, in particular, one thing we were talking about last week was how SSP was going to be changed, statutory sick pay, and how you would need to pay that. Now, last week, we said that's all very well and good for the government to promise that uh, SSP will become available for employees from day one rather than from day four, um, representing, uh, okay, only 40 quid better off per week, but at least payments start immediately. Um, but... SSP is something that the employer has to foot the bill from. Now that has changed. So what we've heard from this is that employers with fewer than 250 employees will be refunded their eligible SSP costs, uh, limited to 14 days per employee, um, including those who self-isolate, not just those who are um, uh, diagnosed. But then of course that is the purpose of the SSP being delivered so early on to encourage people to self-isolate and to be able to self-isolate and supported for doing so if their GP or NHS or 111 or whoever their health professionals has told them that's what they need to do. Um, so that's good that means that SSP is both available to the individual if you need it from day one and also available to be reimbursed to the employer if you need to pay it out from day one. So this is pretty good news. Uh, what else do we have here for that? Um, additional support for those who are ineligible for SSP. Remember we said you have to be earning over a certain amount per week to be eligible for SSP and there's nothing there to do with people who are on zero hours contracts or self-employed. That wasn't referred to last week when we heard the first about this. But now we've heard that um, the so-called New Style Employment and Support Allowance um, will be payable to those directly affected by COVID-19 and those self-isolating. Um, from the first day of sickness or isolation. There's also another thing which is the universal credit minimum income floor uh, will be removed for the duration of the outbreak. So um, if you don't claim universal credit, this won't make much difference to you, but if you do claim universal credit, then you'll be aware as someone who is self-employed, if this is you, that there is a minimum income floor after the first 12 months and assuming you're eligible for all the other reasons. But it basically means most normal people who are self-employed and have been in their business for more than 12 months Universal credit is uh, calculated on the basis that you are earning equivalent to the national minimum wage, which is the same as the national living wage, it's just the renaming, um, at 35 hours per week or less if there's a good reason for why you have to work less hours. Maybe you have to do some childcare, whatever. But it's worked out uh, your entitlement to that benefit on the basis of a uh, minimum income floor, which is equivalent to the national minimum wage or national living wage. Um, and if you earn less than that, uh, tough luck, they will still calculate it on the basis that you do earn that. And that's supposed to be an encouragement uh, for people not to use self-employment as a mechanism for under-earning and claiming benefits uh, to top up the gap. They want you to be pushing for a uh, proper business that's giving you money um, and giving you enough money to uh, keep yourself as if you were employed for those um, hours instead. Um, but... For many businesses with the impact of COVID-19, 
uh, on the bottom line, it may be less profitable for a while. So they are removing that minimum income floor uh, for a uh, temporary basis. I don't have any more details about that, but that's going to be handy if you are on universal credit and you uh, would have the uh, minimum income floor applying to you, that will fall away. So if your income falls uh, because of uh, issues to do with COVID-19, then because that's not there anymore, you, your universal credit will uh, entitlement will be calculated on the basis of your actual income, not the minimum income floor. Um, so that's pretty useful. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, skimming down a, a, a list of bullet points of things uh, that might be worth uh, talking to. There are some loan schemes, uh, the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, um, a new guarantee to support up to £1 billion of lending. One of the documents I'm reading for here, I'll be linking to in the show notes, this is from uh, Money Donut, I think it is. Um, they're pretty pretty good set of resources that we tend to link to, so I will give a link to that in the show notes so that you can go through this yourself. Uh, we did talk about in a previous one, uh, entrepreneurs' relief was going to change. It seems that what they've done, rather than cutting the percentage drop on capital gains tax that was eligible to entrepreneurs, um, they are reducing the lifetime allowance. So you can only make up to uh, one million pounds uh, from selling your companies before uh, the relief goes away. Uh, it was 10 million pounds. So maybe that makes more sense. Uh, this seems like it would still be a scheme that in uh, encourages entrepreneurs uh, who uh, start, grow and sell smaller businesses from doing so over and over and over again. It would still encourage them to do that, um, but the benefit would go away uh, once you've made more than a million. And to be honest, if you've made more than a million from it, I'm sure you can afford the uh, extra, I think it's effective 20%, uh, no, an effective 10% additional capital gains tax that you will be paying to bring you back up to the normal rate, maybe 9%, something like that. But basically the relief goes away once you've gone over um, 1 million um, uh, benefiting from selling your company. So that's that's that, that's handy. Uh, handy to get some detail on that. Handy to hear that it's not gone away entirely uh, because I think that would be discouraging to uh, serial uh, entrepreneurs uh, in the country. So it's good that that's not how it's being uh, dealt with. Let's see what else have we got here. Corporation tax frozen at 19%, but we were expecting that. Um, what else have we got? I think this is the, the main deal. There's a whole long list of uh, things here, but none of them are particularly obviously affecting small business. One more, employment allowance. So employment allowance uh, was £3,000, it's now going to £4,000. If you have employees, you can reclaim employment allowance. Uh, so that will be going up. That's an extra £1,000 um, in, your, in your pocket, essentially, uh, from that or off your tax bill. So useful stuff. Uh, and that's from April 2020. Any other items here worth talking about? Not massively. Uh, there, is, there is one, and I'll get onto that in a minute in more detail, which is a plan for the rising national minimum wage or national living wage, the same thing. Um, there's a target for that to reach two thirds of the national median wage by 2024. I understand that's going to be £10.50 per hour by um, 2024. Now in 2020, that's eight pounds, I've written this down, uh, it will be eight pounds 72, so it's quite a rise. Um, there's one set of people for whom this might affect, and again, it's to do with uh, those who uh, are affected by the uh, universal credit minimum income floor. Uh, and the reason I think that this might be a challenge for small businesses is it's quite usual for small businesses to not make profit for more than a year as they're growing, um, maybe they've taken investment, maybe they've used loans, uh, but they may not be distributing profits to their, I mean, if you're self-employed, you may not be able to take a salary that's equivalent to minimum wage for some time. So this could be a bit of a challenge if you're depending on universal credits to fund your ability to do your work while it grows. Um, that minimum wage floor, that minimum income floor, of course, is removed for now due to COVID-19, but it will come back and it is linked to that minimum wage. And as that rises from £8.72, so for someone who's over 25 um, and working 35 hours per week, that um, is or could work, 
35 hours per week, hasn't got a justified reason not to, that's equivalent to £1,322 a month. If you earn less than that, universal credit would still be based on £1,322 a month. That is once the temporary coronavirus measures uh, go away, which they will at some point in the coming months. So that is the rule that will come back. When that goes up to £10.50 as a minimum wage, then by 2024 that will now be nearly £1,600, which means that your self-employment must be producing £1,600 in order to be unaffected by uh, a reduction in benefits due to the rise in the minimum wage. Um, how, it is only after the first 12 months of your self-employed business. There's already um, no application for that first 12 months. If you're starting a business, you've got a year to get to profitability before your benefits are capped as if you were making minimum wage. Uh, maybe it's not going to be a massive deal for you anyway. Maybe being capped at minimum wage is still sufficient support, um, even though you're under it. But if it does affect you, I can anticipate there are some people who are starting slow growing businesses from home, depending on the universal credit to help them and their families as they do so. There used to be um, like business startup uh, loans and allowances and schemes. Certainly Aegis started on one of these back in the 80s, helping you know, a, a young family get through growing a business with some financial support. Um, there aren't that many of those schemes that seem to be available. Universal credit system seems to be the kind of thing you might use. The amount of support is really for that first year. Uh, and that's basically what they're saying here with this minimum income floor. You've got support for a year, but after that, you're going to be only given as much benefits as someone on minimum wage would be, even if your self-employment is earning less, which means you may need to get side income or change your business plan so that you can get to profitability uh, quicker if uh, that's uh, what you depend on to help your overall uh, income uh, work out in, in your household. So there's definitely going to be an effect there, but um, whether that affects you, of course, depends on your own setup, whether you're depending on universal credit to top up your income or not. If you're not, none of that matters whatsoever. So the only other element that I wanted to talk about from previous news, and not strictly to do with the uh, budget, but has been referred to in the lead up to the budget, is IR35 and the effect of the new legislation that's coming in also in April, which suggests that the clients of a limited company contractor are supposed to uh, be liable for your for the limited company contractors tax and national insurance that they should have paid if they don't correctly determine their IR35 status. Basically, if they think you're a disguised employee and you should be paying POI tax, they should implement that or they should tell you that you need to implement that. It's their responsibility to tell you what the status is. They are liable, it seems, for the costs if they get it wrong. Um, but it's not as easy as that. Um, and the reason I've been looking at this in depth is because there are situations where there are the unintended side effect candidate that um, most of this has been coming for a very long time. It is aimed at people who use limited companies to escape paying the regular POI tax setup and instead pay themselves a combination of salary and dividends to pay overall less tax. But if they are essentially in the same arrangement as an employee would be with that business, HMRC has for a long time been gunning for that to say we need to remove that as a, as a thing you can do. It shouldn't be possible, really, if you're employed like anyone else, you should be paying the same taxes as anybody else. They've been going for it for a long time. I'm unsurprised that the review of IR35 has changed. Nothing. <laughs> this is um, still what's going to happen. Uh, all that's come out is that they will be lenient on those businesses in the first year um, of applying uh, this um, rule because it's uh, it's tricky. Now there's one thing I found out that I didn't know then that I wanted to share which is the liability is only on the client, that is the business that's engaged the limited company contracted for their services. The client only has that liability if they are not small and that is according to how companies house would um, would measure them as small and there are some designations that you can find um, on companies house websites that tell you what small is but that's really tricky because that now means that if you are a limited company contractor and you're going out there into the world and then you are engaging with clients you then need to understand is the client 
small, according to Companies House. If they are, the limited company that the contractor works within has the responsibility still, has the liability still, to figure out whether you are inside or outside IR35, like they always used to. If your client is big, then they have the liability. Which means that if you're a contractor, it would seem that you don't really have to think too hard. If you're engaging your work with only big clients, then really the liability is now with them to designate whether you can take the advantage of paying yourself through dividend and salary, or whether you must salary yourself completely and ensure that the proper national insurance and POIE levels of tax are applied. It's their liability and it's their responsibility to uh, determine whether you are inside or outside of IR35, as they say. But it becomes your responsibility now to determine whether it's their responsibility to determine whether you're inside, inside or outside of IR35, because if they are small according to company's house, the onus is still on your limited company to make sure that you're doing it right, and the ongoing liability is still on your company to make sure you're doing it right. So, um, yeah, I... I thought that the movement of liability from the limited company that the contractor works through to the uh, client would make things probably easier on limited company owners because now it's not your job anymore. You can set yourself up, say, I'm a limited company, I provide services, and you figure out whether I can pay myself with dividends or whatever, or whether we need to sort out some kind of POI thing. But apparently it's not a clear cut because if the client is small, according to Companies House measure of small, then actually the liability is still with you. So an important caveat if that affects you. Um, and I think that's it from the budget and recent news to do with all of that. Check these long notes that I've got. What else did I pick up on? Uh, I think that was mostly, most, most of the details, yeah. If you are worried about how universal credit may be affected, uh, because that affects you um, and you use that to support your income from your own small business or self-employment, then we rather like Turn To Us. It's a uh, charity, I believe, uh, that is particularly good at figuring out benefits and how they work on behalf of the people who contact them. They've also got a benefits calculator. Don't know if that will be up to date yet with all of the new changes and all of the uh, coronavirus specific temporary changes but there will at least be someone who could help. Uh, they may even have a phone line. Likewise, Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, I, I've used both previously. They are incredibly helpful and they want to help. So if you're facing hardship uh, or difficulty uh, due to coronavirus or just due to uh, normal life and your setup, working self-employed or in a small business, either of those are fantastic resources. Uh, they all want to help. They're all very friendly. Uh, give them a go. And if you're just looking for news on the budget, uh, then uh, the, the link that I'll provide in the show notes has loads of great information uh, on that. So let's leave that complicated stuff behind. Um, the, uh, the budget was somewhat late uh, this year. We would normally expect an awful lot of those details, obviously not the coronavirus temporary stuff, but we'd expect the other details to have been sorted and made clear back in autumn. So there does, you will have to grant the people who make calculators a little bit of extra time because they, they've only had access to this information or much of this information for a very short time. They've got to make all their calculators and predictors and tax planning tools work for a few weeks from now and onwards for the entire of next year. So it is rather frustrating to have such a delayed budget, um, especially when, as we are, we're trying to give good advice to our clients as to how to move forward. Um, Imagine if you were selling a business now and you didn't know about the changes, um, what the changes were going to look like to uh, the entrepreneur's allowance. It's, it's really tricky if you don't have the information from the government as to how they're going to change the rules uh, until two weeks before they come into effect or just a, just a little bit over. Anyway, that's our lovely time uh, interpreting the budget. Um, but on to the next part, which is to do with remote working, because that's going to be something that may affect you quite a bit over the coming months. Nice big glug of coffee, and it's the next one. So uh, I shared a recently a handy uh, post um, on social media that was from Harvard Business Review, and it was a general post to do with um, 
how coronavirus could force teams to work remotely. That was the, the, the titles of it. Uh, and it's worth considering that for many small businesses, uh, that's not already a setup that you do. Now, at Aegis, we're a uh, family business and we all live in different parts of the country. So remote working is our day to day. Uh, and so I wanted to share some of the tips that um, I have from this setup that we have, but also some tips from my previous uh, role uh, when I was an employee and also working remotely quite frequently. Um, and there's lots of things which really help to make that work. And if you're going to have to make a switch to remote working, you've not done that before, um, then this can be really useful. There's a couple of things this article pointed to which I absolutely thoroughly agree are important. Spelling out the roles and everyone's goals. I mean, you probably have that already for people all working together in a small business, but you need to make it crystal clear if you're not constantly guiding um, throughout the day by asking those questions. There's the, there's the old adage, what gets measured gets managed. And partially, your measurement as to whether your team in your business are doing the right things is just asking questions throughout the day. You might be passing each other at coffee time and say, oh, um, how's, uh, how's Bob doing? How's, how's, how's our client? Did you sort that thing out for them? Yeah, I think it's quite important. Can you get that done by the week? Because I'm, I'm worried about what's going to happen. These little conversations that just happen, that constantly guide your team to what are your priorities, don't happen when you're not all in the same office. You have to manufacture the opportunity to make sure goals and roles are clear. And, and that's going to be super clear. And there may be some changes as you move to remote working. You may move some responsibilities to different people. There may be some new responsibilities to do with uh, team management in a remote working setup that you will need to delegate to people. So you want to make sure that you clarify and re-clarify goals and, and roles. And there's a bit on that in this article. Um, and there's a part here about mapping the skills and the capacity that you have. Um, you've got lots of people working on multiple teams, multiple projects, and you do want to make sure that the skill and capacity is sort of understood. That might be just lots of touch, uh, lots of uh, keeping in touch to understand if uh, who's got relaxed timetable and who's working 80 hours in the week. You won't be able to do that if uh, automatically, if employees are not in sight. If you're used to working in an office, you can see that Jane's busy and Joe is not, but when you're not in the office, you're going to actually have to ask. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, it's on that, on that notion of not having those constant, no effort, personal interactions. You're going to have to emphasize them. You're going to need to manufacture the water cooler moments. Um, and you have to keep everyone in mind who is not necessarily, um, they won't all manufacture those. So some people in a business will make calls and team meetings just for checkups regularly. Um, and some people will rely on known contacts that they give a lot of work to, um, they have a close relationship in the office, uh, and they'll, be, they'll just ring, ring up them and ask them to handle things. But there are lots of people on the team and you need to keep everyone in mind and be distributing work uh, sensibly, especially when you can't tell necessarily who's overworked and who's not. Um, yeah, it's, keeping in touch is really the underlying theme of all of this. Uh, because it's not it's not naturally done. There's another aspect, and I don't think it's said much um, here, but there's there's a perception issue. Uh, that is, most of communication is non-verbal. So when you see someone face to face, it's why we record these videos, um, and and why we do do the podcast. If all you knew about just accounting was the written word, uh, well, the written word posts that I'd produced, you wouldn't have very much of a whole picture of what I'm like. Uh, you wouldn't know much about us as a business. But if you can see us and hear us, uh, you get a much stronger perception of who we are and what we're like, which is great. From a marketing perspective, yes, we want to close the gap of the internet. We want to be a little bit closer to you than uh, than if we if all you saw were our, was our website and this is part of doing that, having videos and, and things like that the same can be said of video calling it's a lot better than audio only audio calling is still very good if you're just writing emails you need to be prepared for a lot of miscommunication it is very easy to misunderstand what someone has said i mean how many times have you read an email and thought to yourself 
were they being snarky there? If you'd have said it in person, you would have just known whether they meant it or whether they were being snarky with you. You'd just know. Uh, all of that non-verbal communication, most of it's physical, some of it is how your tone of voice carries, um, but if you don't have that, then miscommunication will be something that happens and the people's perception of you will be driven by a very small amount of your communication. Maybe it's the message you write on your messaging client or maybe it's the sentence that you put into your email. So you'll need to be extra careful with your written communication and you need to make the effort to have calls and video calls. I mean, Hangouts is free for video calls. I think there's, you, know, you don't have to be paying for a service to do this. Um, it's really helpful to really see and hear each other still, like you're in an office. Um, and it's 2020, so the technology's there. You should be able to do it. Um, I highly advise that you do. Um, so what else was I gonna say about remote working? Maybe foisted upon you in this period because of COVID-19, you may have no choice. Some in your, some in your team self-isolate. Maybe your entire office has to um, disband. Um, you should probably understand that before going into it, if that wasn't your working pattern and you managed to adjust and make it your working pattern, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right long-term solution for you and your team. There are so many advantages to being in the same office and space that you won't feel them fall away for a very long time. So please make remote working work for you but don't fall into the trap of thinking remote working is the right working pattern for you and your business necessarily. If it wasn't what you were doing before and what you were doing before was working, then probably remote working still needs to be more of a rarity um, once the threat of coronavirus and the need for isolation, uh, self-isolation uh, has passed. But you can make it work in the short term. Uh, there are plenty of tools to help you to do that. Um, but there are the risks from miscommunication that you'll need to manage. Uh, which brings us on to the last piece, which is some real specifics. Here are some tools to help you make remote working effective um, and, uh, yeah, and make it work while you need to do it. So the first and foremost one, you need some always on communication method. And the reason for this, I'll, Last place that I worked, we had a tool, and I, th I think it was called Link. It's since been absorbed by Microsoft into, I think it's Microsoft Teams, um, but it was a basically an instant messaging platform. You don't need to use Microsoft Teams if you don't want to. There are plenty of instant messaging platforms. Um, but you were able to set your status. The good thing about it is it was linked to your, your calendar. So if your calendar said you were busy, then there would be a little red like light that would say you are online but busy. Um, that helps with perception because the perception of you is not necessarily that you're... Everyone's afraid that you're going to be slacking if you're working from home. Let's say the obvious thing that I haven't said so far. People will be afraid that some workers will take advantage of the fact that you're working outside, outside of the view of the office to slack. And you want to make sure that no one has that perception of you. And it can be helpful to remove that perception by being in contact frequently uh, and to show your, your status and what you're working on. It's quite helpful if your instant messaging, always on way of communicating with your team has a status for you to say what you're doing uh, and you use it. Uh, it can be very helpful because you might have a red light, but it's not do not disturb. You might have a little red light on saying, uh, working on preparing a document. If someone needs to call you, they can call you, but if they don't need to interrupt you, they should wait. Um, that can be quite helpful. Uh, I don't know whether that status is available in the free tool I'm about to mention, but it is free and Zuckerberg isn't listening. Uh, we use Signal. Um, we don't have to have availability lights on in our small business, but we do want to be able to get in contact with each other as instantly as you might with WhatsApp. I don't suggest a WhatsApp group. My concern is GDPR. I don't want to discuss client details across a um, platform where I'm not in control of the logs, where they sit, who has them, and Facebook has access to the data. That doesn't seem right to me. I use Signal. Uh, we use Signal. It's encrypted end-to-end -end like WhatsApp is, but not with a server in the middle that can see everything. So uh, I can have a log. The other people in the business can have a log of the conversation, but no one else does. 
Um, and that's, we think that's better from a GDPR perspective, or just general data protection perspective. We can discuss confidential client things and know that the people who can see it on the chat are the only people who can see the details of their conversation. Um, so that's, that's what we use. It doesn't have that status thing, so if the status thing is important to you, um, I think you might need to check other tools. Uh, lots of people have success with Slack. Lots of people have success with what used to be called Link. That was L-Y-N-C, I believe, which I think is now Microsoft Teams if it does interact with your um, calendar as well. If you use the Microsoft Office suite, then that can be useful. So look up those kinds of things. It is incredibly useful to have an easy, always-on communication method. It works on your mobile, works on your desktop. Um, and people can know that they can ask you a question and that you can get back to them. And do make the effort to respond, even if you're busy, to say, I'll get back to you on that in a minute, whatever. Just be contactable. So the one thing you don't want is a perception that you've gone offline, really. What you want is perception that you're busy, that's fine, and people may need to wait for stuff, that's fine, but be reactive, be contactable, um, and everyone will know that everyone is busy and doing their best to uh, do their work properly. So that's useful. Um, what else? Oh, this is, a, this is a really important one. When you are writing things by email, and this probably goes outside of the remote working, this is true for outsourcing too, uh, this is true for just in, in general, um, there are some golden rules for delegation of tasks that I think everyone should know, even if you are normally the receiver of delegated tasks rather than the giver of delegated tasks. Uh, there was a time when I worked briefly as a consultant uh, at an organisation I used to work for. Um, I tried to apply it there because when you are now doing a piece of work for somebody uh, and you're constantly negotiating the requirements, requirements on that piece of work, a lot of this is quite natural. Let me go through the, through the rules. The most obvious thing is if you're going to give some work to someone, make your definition of that work smart, that is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound, smart. So if it's specific, then you're gonna have your list of requirements. If you're measurable, if it's measurable, what you're saying is you'll know when it's done. Uh, if it's achievable, yes, you need to have thought whether this is something that can be done. Don't give people impossible tasks. And you need to have understood if it is a realistic thing that can be completed within a specified time. Give a deadline. So make it smart. That's the first one. The second one is, Give context. If you're not going to tell people exactly how they're going to do a piece of work, I hope you won't because it's not effective delegating, then you are going to need to give them the context of why they're doing the job in the first place so they can infer the best way to go about doing what they're doing to deliver the benefit that was intended. If you're writing a document that's intended to write a pitch, you could specify what the document has to have in it. But if you don't state that it is to win a piece of business, it may not have the marketing spin on its content that you were looking for. So give the context. That's the second rule. The third one, choose who's going to do it and sell them and why you've chosen them. If there's someone in your team who is really good at doing a certain thing, then you should say that's why you've chosen them. It's a good thing, it feels good when, you've been, when you know that you haven't just been foisted on a piece of work on you that the delegator doesn't want to do. It's more that you have the right skills to make a good job of this. Can I give this to you so that you can, you can do it? I'd, I'd really like you to do this. That is a much better way of giving someone a task than just saying, I don't want to do it, you do it. So yeah, sell on, on, on why you've chosen them. Uh, next one, provide them with the resources they need to do the job. Maybe they don't have all the information. Maybe you need to give them contacts that they can contact to get more. Maybe you need to give them links to stuff on the internet that you've used, that you want to incorporate into whatever this piece of work is. Uh, maybe you need to give them literal money to complete it. There are resources they need, provide them. Lastly, well nearly lastly, provide um, the actual authority to get the work done. So there may be some decision making involved where you may say in advance, um, you may say, for example, resources wise, whatever they're doing, they may have a budget of £100 to complete this piece of work. You may give them the authority to spend up to 50 more if you think it's really going to increase the chance that it's effective. Give them some authority to make some more decisions without having to come back to you. If you're delegating a task, you don't need constant backwards and forwards to okay whether it's okay to do this thing this way. 
you want to give them enough authority to do it, which is true when you're giving them resources of contacts. You want those contacts in CC so that they know that you have told someone that they're going to do a job and you've told them that they may contact this person. So they know what to expect and they know that you have the authority to do this piece of work. Maybe you're delegating a supplier relationship. You want to CC the supplier to say so that they know that this person you've delegated to will now be taking care of the relationship. You've given them the authority to do that. So make sure they've got the authority they need. Uh, one of these is arrange a check-in. If there's a long piece of work, arrange when you'll check in next. It's very simple to say, I'll catch up with you on Monday to see how far you've got. Or you might want to say something specific. Maybe if you're making a big document, say, I'll catch up on Monday to have a quick look through the first draft. And then you've given them a basically like a milestone. By Monday, I want the first draft of it. I'm not saying it has to be finished, but I'd like to have a quick look through on Monday to make sure we're going in the right direction. Finally, and this comes down to the how, how they do the piece of work should really be down to them. It's hard for people to really buy into doing tasks for you if you don't give them the opportunity to do it their way. That's what makes you feel good about doing a job. When you've chosen how you're going to go about it and you've done it well your way. That's when you feel best about it. You want to give people the opportunity to uh, feel that way. And so assuming they are sufficiently trained to do the task, you can simply ask, I, I'm sure you know how to get on with that. And they can say, yeah, I'm on it. It's fine. They'll appreciate that. There are other levels of how much you might want to tell people how to do a thing, depending on how experienced they are. For example, you might want to ask if they know how to do something if you've never delegated that kind of a task to them. That's just saying, do you know how to do this? And if they say yes, then you can assume they're going to get on with it. You may suggest how to do it if there's something complex about it, it's a novel thing, um, maybe it could be to do with some of the people that you've put in CC that are resources and contacts, and you may suggest, I'd suggest the first thing to do would be to talk to Steph, she's got a great handle on how to break down the document to start with, and then go from there. So you might suggest a bit of how if it's a novel piece of work and you sort of know how the first step you want it to be, uh, how you want that task to be broken down. A little. But don't step in on how to do the whole thing. You take away all of the, all of the joy of work uh, away from someone if you do that. And if they are totally unaware about how to do something, you may tell them exactly how to do it. But get ready for micromanagement. They're going to call back because they know that you've told them how to do it. They know that you aren't control as to how they do their work. They basically know you want to micromanage this process. If you give them how to do that piece of work, they will constantly be backwards and forwards. You won't really have delegated the task that much at all. So it is far better to simply verify that someone knows how to do something and can handle it themselves, but there are levels of micromanagement that you may need, uh, depending on how experienced they are. And as you start remote working with people, and maybe you don't know whether they can or can't do this stuff all on their own, maybe you'll ask more questions about how they intend to do something than you will uh, a few months later when you simply say, would you do that for me? And a simple yes, and you believe they're going to do it for you, and that's fine. But it is one of those golden rules of delegation to either verify they know what they're doing or to help them with how to do it. So, they were seven golden rules of delegation. Make it smart, give it context, Choose your worker that you're delegating to, sell them on why you've chosen them, provide them the resources they need, provide the authority they need, arrange a check-in if it's a long piece of work to see a certain part of it or milestone, and finally, either give them, suggest to them, or ask them how they're going to do it, or simply verify that they know how to do it if you're already confident in their abilities, and hopefully it's that last one, because then Delegations of breeze. Seven rules of delegation, I hope you find that really useful. When you're practiced at that and you're writing an email to pass a task from one person to another, you know that if it has all of those elements, when you delegate a task, it will be that one email and not a long conversation backwards and forwards. The flip side of it is also useful. If you're on the receiving end of tasks, sometimes 
the person you're working for doesn't know these golden rules and instead passes you an idea of a thing that they want you to do. It is a great, great thing to do to fill out what you think those seven things are, maybe ignoring why you've been chosen for it. If they didn't tell you that, it doesn't matter. But the rest, if you can reflect that back, that can be very useful to check and to propose what you're going to do. So if someone says something very generic to you, like, uh, can you do a piece of work X for me, please? Then you might respond with, um, okay, I'll take on piece of work X. Um, I'll do this, this, and this to deliver on this date. Um, I guess I will need to talk to this person and that person. Do I have authority to do this? And I'll check in with you on Monday to show you a first draft to see how far we've got. If you do that as a proactive recipient of tasks, again, you'll minimise backwards and forwards on emails to flesh out details on, on jobs. This skill seems like it might be cracking a walnut with a sledgehammer, but if you have anything that's not a trivial task and you're passing it between teams, or between people who are working remotely from each other, you won't have the constant capability to check in by looking over their shoulder or asking at the coffee machine, oh, how are you getting on with that? You won't have those opportunities. So if to, to have set it out well at the start will remove a lot of headaches where towards the end of this piece of work, you finally get to see it and you realise it went in completely the wrong direction because either you didn't give enough information or you didn't check in earlier um, to see if it was going in the right direction. The relationship works both ways. If you're being given tasks, again, just, just check. <laughs> check these elements. It can be very, very helpful. So today we've spoken a little bit about the budget uh, and how that may affect you. Uh, a couple of specific things to do with SSP uh, and the uh, current virus outbreak, um, IR35 and liabilities and the rise in uh, the uh, minimum income floor for universal tax credit, if those things affect you. We've also talked about remote working, uh, some general approaches to remote working and what's gonna be really important if you're going to need to set that up for you and your, your other colleagues in your small business, and some very specific tools and tips to make it work, uh, to do with having some always on communications like a messenger especially if it can give some status as to what you're doing right now, it's going to be very useful. Um, and the seven golden rules of delegation and being able to use them as you delegate and being able to use them when tasks are delegated to you. All incredibly important when you're suddenly communicating remotely and less frequently and you can't just have those two second catch ups uh, over the coffee machine. I hope you found something today useful. I know there's a lot of potential changes in work and tax and coronavirus affected stuff at the moment. I hope that some of these things that we've gone through today will be of use. That's it for this week. Uh, hope to see you again in the next one. Um, please share what we do. Uh, we'd love to be able to reach more people than we currently do. Uh, on whatever platform you're using, use whatever share buttons or methods that you can to get the message out far and wide, especially if you think that something we've discussed today would be helpful to someone you know. Maybe you'd mm -hmm. like to share this with them. Well, thanks again, and uh, talk to you in the next one. Bye.